I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to just read a, two or three verses here. Uh, it's in the context, of course, of the Apostle Paul um, writing to the Corinthians about the uh, way in which the Hebrews, when they were in the wilderness, they murmured. And I've got to um, align myself a little bit with this. Although they had terrible destruction there, they were destroyed by serpents there in verse 9, in tempting the Lord. I'm in danger, and I've got to make this confession here, of when we think about end times, and I think about end times, come quickly, Lord, and deliver us from this, as it were. Uh, without really understanding and realising that I myself have a, a role in this, that um, I've got to be upright before the Lord Almighty. He's coming, yes, to deliver us. But somehow that puts the emphasis, as it were, on um, the rescue, as it were, um, and puts the onus, as it were, of, of taking us away from the mess that this world is getting into. So, Lord, deliver us from it. You know, the world, I'm pointing at other people there, and I can think of all sorts of names of uh, global leaders and so forth. It's easy to do that, isn't it? And the, the problem is, and, and the more I think about the, these things, the, more, the less I think about, how do I stand before Almighty God? Mm. Am I ready to meet him? Because I believe he's coming soon for us. Let, let's just read a few verses then. You'll see that um, uh, Paul is giving warnings here. Verse 10, neither murmur ye... As some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all these things happened unto them for ensamples, that they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. How topical is that? We're thinking about this tonight, aren't we? The world in crisis. And I've believe that we're coming toward that time and the Lord will take us out of this. But as I say, let, let's just consider these things. Because verse 12 goes on, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 12 now says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. And that really is a warning to myself, and I'm sharing it with you. It may be a warning to you as well to consider our relationship before Almighty God, and especially in the context of the imminent return of the Lord Jesus. We are grateful to the Lord for his servant, Paul, who has been our chairman, served as our chairman tonight, and we thank him warmly. I'd like to say a word of sincere appreciation for your welcome here. I think I've been coming about 100 years. <laughs> And it's a joy always to come. First of all, you dear people live in a beautiful part of our country. I've enjoyed the drive down 200 and something, 50 miles. Uh, I've been doing it all my life, driving different places. So it was no uh, great, you know, uh, onerous task. Thank you for your welcome. And thank you for having me back again to speak at this prophetic witness <coughs> meeting. Um, the, the Lord is blessing the movement, the prophetic witness movement. We have a number of young men coming up. That's good because the old guys are on their way out. That's, I refer to myself, I'm one of the old guys. We're on our way out, uh, not just yet, but uh, we have some good young fellows coming up. They can preach the word and they love this book and they're determined to preach it. And we're very, very grateful to the Lord for them. And then we're opening new branches. We have a new, two new ones in the north of England, um, a little bit north of where I live. Uh, and we thank the Lord for what is happening in prophetic witness. And Colin Lanuri, our general secretary, I do commend him to your prayers. He's a wonderful man. He always gives a marvelous word. He has a very sick wife. I think he's probably her full-time helper. What do, you, what do we say? Carer. Com Carer, yes, that's the word. And we thank the Lord for Colin. But even dear Colin is uh, beginning to look a bit frail. 
Uh, but uh, that goes for me as well. I'm 83 and will be 84 before the end of the year, but I was in Romania three weeks and had a week, first week of the three, I spoke to over 100 young people on the camp field amongst the Christian brethren in Romania. And uh, one night I was ministering, I prayed so much about it, prayed the Lord to go before me. My family, I don't think they wanted me to go. They're afraid, they're scared I'm going to die in Romania. I said, don't worry about me. If I pass away, I have a lot of friends. They'll dig a nice hole and put me in, and I'll see you the other side. They, they didn't laugh. They didn't think that was funny. So one night, as I was ministering the Word of God to all these lovely young people, we do love them, over 100, I mentioned. So that some of them are very smart. They're in university and so on. Um, I felt, I, I don't think I've known before, there were words coming out of my mouth I don't ever remember contemplating or thinking about or planning before. And I thought, this is the Lord. And I kept my mind on the Lord and I kept on speaking. I said, any of you young people, God loves you. I love you. All the leaders here love you. Uh, how many of you here have never been sure that you're saved? because my message that night was how to be saved and sure. God wants you to be sure, I said. And you can be sure tonight that you've been born again and this is to the night of your eternal salvation. When I stopped speaking, 10 lovely young people stood to their feet. Uh, very, very keen young folks, I mean, I don't play football anymore, but I was out on the field with them and pulling their legs and doing things with them. I like working with young people. These 10 young people, it was lovely to see them, some of them in tears, mm -hmm. weeping their way to the cross. They wanted to be saved. Well, we were counseling till late, nearly midnight. I got to bed. All the youngsters are under canvas. You have to bring your own tent. But I have a hut, as the other leaders, a little hut, in Romania, we're up in the, in the Carpathian Mountains. There are bears in the woods around us. Think of that. Uh, and uh, I went to bed, and then there was a knock at the door. Alec, yes. Are you in bed? Yes. Could you come? Yes, of course. Is there trouble? No. Two more young people want to be saved. <laughs> They'd gone to bed, couldn't sleep. They wanted to make their peace with God and be sure they were saved. Wasn't that wonderful? That made the trip worthwhile. That paid for the trip. And uh, I placed my humble life in the hands of the Lord and the money side and things. And uh, my family didn't really want me to go. They're all scared for their dads. By the time I retired, oh dear, I, I, I don't want to be retired. I want to be retreaded. <laughs> uh, I want a few more miles to go for the Lord. So uh, anyway, I've uh, 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 agreed to go in March to the Bible school. They have a lovely Bible school there. And there'll be over 100 young people there, young men, it's my brethren. And the uh, young lads will come. And they want me to, to preach the book of the Revelation. What a privilege. So I've started doing my homework right away. I've done a bit of homework on the book of the Revelation, the Apocalypse before, but I'm going to try and get some very special messages ready for them. And they're all looking forward to it. Right, that's a little preamble. Thank you for coming. Lovely to see you. And thank you so much for your welcome and having an old guy to be your preacher tonight. Um, it is a joy to be here. Thank Keith. He's been looking after me. I've been looking after him. I don't know, how, perhaps a bit of each. And we've had a lovely time, and his family have been very kind as well. Now, we're going to turn now to the book that God wrote. Many, many books about, and papers, particularly newspapers. But we're going to turn tonight to the only book that God wrote. It's his only published work. He wrote no other book. Of course, there's the book of creation and the book of conscience within us. There are other witnesses and our, the supreme witness to God is the person of his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God the Son, as well as the Son of God. 
But we're going to turn to this wonderful book because, brothers and sisters, the world is in trouble. Do you know that? Britain's in trouble. The whole world is in trouble. And it's going to take somebody bigger than Rishi, what's he called? Wishy washy wash. It's going to take somebody bigger than him to put the world back on a firm axis of integrity and honesty and justice. And that man is Jesus Christ. He is the cure. There is no other cure. And it's going to require the return of Christ to save our world. So let's turn in this wonderful book to the Gospel of Luke, please. Chapter 21. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. That gives us the context of the Lord's ministry. And then from verse 7, please, down the chapter 21 to verse 7. They asked him, saying, Master, when shall these things be? And what sign will there be that these things shall come to pass? They were asking about the end of the age. And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draws near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. And will you turn forward in that same chapter, please, to verse 24. Same chapter, verse 24, where the ominous predictions of the Lord Jesus continue. They shall fall by the edge of the sword. They shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Just pause there. We're going to read on, but just pause at verse 24. There we have a one verse overview of the history of the Jewish people. They shall fall by the edge of the sword. Yes, AD 70. They shall be led away captive into all nations. Yes, that's being fulfilled. The diaspora, 2,000 years. Jerusalem trodden down of the Gentiles. Oh yes, right up until this time. But not forever, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. What a wonderful prophecy. And then, please, to verse 36. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spoke to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves, that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see all these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God, the righteous reign of Christ, is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation, it's a reference to the Jewish people, shall not pass away until all be fulfilled, and heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, that is, uh, overeating and drunkenness, and the cares of this life, anxiety, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare it shall come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. And here's a word for us. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. May God help us in our understanding of these divine inspired scriptures that we've read from God's only published work, I've called it, the Word of God, 
the Bible. Although you do know, don't you, the word Bible is not a Bible word. The word Bible doesn't appear in the Bible. <laughs> when the scripture refers to itself, as in 2 Timothy, as it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, we've had a dramatic reading there. Brothers and sisters, the people of the world, and I mix with them quite a bit, we have open air meetings in the north of England on a Saturday in the big city of Lancaster, our county city, county town, and university city, many hundreds of young people from all over the world, including Russia. And then on Tuesdays, we go to the city of Preston, to the flag market, hundreds of people there as well. The people I mix with often, they tell me that they have a kind of an intuitive hunch, a feeling that the world is headed for some great crisis. Mm. What the crisis is, they don't know. But what they say is, young people especially, well, the world can't go on like this. Correct. And it won't. It's the same as saying the world is headed for some great crisis and they don't know what this crisis is. And my subject this evening, which is on the leaflets, which you perhaps saw, is about the coming world crisis and what is going to happen. Is time running out for the human race? Global problems, insurmountable problems. Is that what is the world headed for? Well, praise God, I hold in my hand tonight the solitary book that tells the truth about the destiny of mankind in the latter days. This book alone will teach us and instruct us of where the world is heading. Now, isn't that worth knowing? You won't get it on the BBC. You'll get it in the Bible, the best book on earth. That's sort of like the BBC, perhaps. <laughs> it is the only book that will tell us, I repeat myself, the destiny of mankind in the last days. The Bible is God's roadmap. And we never must be ashamed of the Bible. Sometimes we've been tempted to feel ashamed of this wonderful book, to take it onto the streets. Uh, many Christians carry their Bibles as a witness. I've started to carry mine, and people see it. They, they think, oh, what's that book he's carrying so carefully and publicly? We must never, we should never be ashamed or coy about the Bible. It is the, the clue to God's tremendous future and is God's written revelation. The Bible, we must never be ashamed of it, it's the world's earliest book. The Bible predates all other books in the world and was the first book that was ever printed. Perhaps you know this. It was printed in A.D. Uh, 1450 in the German presses of Gutenberg. Uh, all those years ago, almost a, a thousand years ago, the Word of God was alive and was being printed. The first book that was ever printed is our Bible, the Old and the New Testament. And today, I've tried to get my facts right. It is annually printed, the Word of God, in six hundred languages and 1,000 dialects or tongues of the world. Friends, the Bible is the most printed and published book on earth today. And that's after 2,000 years. Same Bible. The most printed and published. No other book has so many copies printed as the book that God wrote the scriptures. The Bible is the world's bestseller. Get it? So we've no need to be ashamed or have reserves or coy. We can trust the Bible. This book teaches me that the human history will end at the feet of Jesus Christ. He will be Lord of all. But is he about to return? Could we be living just before he comes. In Luke 21 and verse 7, we read, They asked the Master, the Lord Jesus, saying, Master, when shall these things be? 
And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? They were inquiring him if there would be signals or signs. Master, will we know when you're about to return, will there be signs of the times? Will there be some signals that will come to the world that will place the world on alert that Jesus the King is coming back? And what shall the sign be? Well, he speaks about a number of these signs, and I have time to mention just two. Number one, the re-emergence on the world scene after 2,000 years of the Jewish nation of Israel. After 2,000 years, the re-emergence as a state, a nation, uh, she has a flag at the United Nations in, New in America, all the flags of the nations lined up, Israel is there. For the first time in 2,000 years, Israel is alive again and has come back to life. And if you look in your Bibles, verse 29, here the Lord Jesus speaks about it. He spoke a parable saying, Behold, it means look with, with intent, the fig tree and all the trees. What's he speaking about? Well, we don't know the fig tree. What's that? Well, when Jesus was preaching, everybody knew what the fig tree was. He was speaking of his own nation, a political entity, because uh, Israel is more than a political, geographical entity. Entity is a spiritual thing. But he says, look at the fig tree and all the trees. Verse 30. When they now shoot forth and bud, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh, near, at hand. Here the Lord Jesus is teaching. If ever you see the nation of Israel dried up, Jewish people, stateless, homeless, landless, scattered across the countries of the world, but if ever you see that fig tree nation budding back into life, make a note of it. It means that the kingdom of God, the reign of Jesus, the return of Jesus is near. When I was born uh, all those years ago, I did let out my age. I don't usually tell people how old I am. It doesn't matter anyway. Um, age is just a number, isn't it? Uh, when I was born, there was no such a place as Israel. Israel did not exist. But in my comparatively, historically, Short lifetime, a nation has been born, 1948. And since 1948, a nation has been born and is budding back into life. Recently, Israel's 70th birthday. God's, some call it God's super sign. The rebirth of the Jewish nation. In unbelief, it's true, the Jewish people are not yet born again. They will be. Read the book of Ezekiel. But they are in unbelief, but the nation has budded back into life. Israel is now the home of 43% of the world's Jewish people, boasting some 8 million, 842,000 citizens only were there in 1948, there are now 806,000 Jews. You know, the uh, land of Israel has others, Arabs and so-called Palestinians, but it is estimated that by 2030, the population of Israel will surpass 10 million. The fig tree is budding. The land is growing. Cities are built. Universities are built world-leading universities, and they're all from the land of the Bible. The Jewish population, when Israel began, was declared a state by Father David Ben-Gurion in 1948. Israel had 500 towns. She's now 1,800 towns. Now, as I preach these things and preach the place of Israel, 
the miracle of the Jewish nation reborn. Often people say to me at the door, and it's okay, um, I, we have to be open to questions, uh, as long as they're nice questions. We don't want questions like, how much longer do you go on? <laughs> no. They say, the objectors, but if all the Jews, Mr. Passmore, if all the Jews in the world returned to the land of the Bible, there wouldn't be enough room for them to live there. Is that right? Yes, it is. But wait, the land called Israel now is hardly a third of the biblically mandated land that God will give them eventually. Indeed, the modern country, this little state of Israel, is less, I think it's just almost 11 miles across at the waist, a tiny strip of land in the Middle East that all the world is afraid of and portray as a great menacing nation. No, of course Israel has to have defense. The Jewish people live in a rough neighborhood and they've got to look after themselves. So how do we answer? If all the Jews of the world went back to the land of Israel, there wouldn't be room. Come to the book of Genesis. If you have your Bibles, open your Bibles, please, to Genesis and uh, chapter 15. Book of Genesis. We're going back again to the book that God wrote to guide us and to teach us and lay out the destiny of mankind in the last days. Genesis chapter 15, and we're down the chapter to verse 17. And it came to pass, here is the covenant, the, the covenant God made with Abraham of a land and a people and a Messiah. It came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that's the Lord that passed between those two pieces. Here is the, the Abrahamic covenant or agreement. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto your seed, that is your physical descendants, have I given this land. Look what it says next. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Oh, now, that is a colossal landmass in the Middle East. The river of Egypt. The Nile, probably. There's a little river that runs through the Sinai called Wadi El Arish. I think we were at it once. So it may be from there, but from Egypt right up to the great river, the river Euphrates in modern Iraq. A big slice of the Middle East down here. So don't worry. There'll be plenty of room for the Jewish people. They only have about a third or less of the land today that was mandated to them by the Lord and to Abraham. Father David Ben-Gurion, who inaugurated the modern state of Israel in 1948, announced that two million Jewish people could live in the Sinai. He lived in the Sinai. If ever you've flown out of the little port, little airport of Ovda down in the, uh, in the desert of Sinai, we flew out there once, they show you his house. He lived in the desert, the Sinai. And there's nothing grows there, nothing lives there, no animals, no flora, no fauna, but it's a part of the biblical land God mandated for them. Here's an astonishing fact. I think it was two years ago, the state of Israel announced, announced that today they are planning for five million Jewish people, they're planning to live in the Sinai, in the desert. There is plenty of room for the Jewish people to go. There's no rain there, but here is the inventive genius of the Jewish mind. Do you know that they have, they are in the process of perfecting the science of desalination? And in Israel, they're drinking seawater. Mm. <laughs> oh, but the Jewish people can't go back to the land. Most of it, a lot of it is just desert. Mr. Passmore, you're preaching nonsense. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And after all, God kept his people for 40 years in the wilderness, did he not? God is God. He knows what to do. And he says he's going to bring them all back to the land of Israel. And uh, there will be plenty of room for them. Here's a lovely verse in Psalm 102 and verse 13. I like to look up these scriptures. Psalm 102, please. And we're at verse 13. A lovely verse about the future of, of uh, Israel. Psalm 102 and verse 13. Here we have what's happening today. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion. For the time to favor her, yea, the set time has come. It's been 2,000 years coming. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth thy glory. Israel's restoration will be a revelation to the world. And look at this word, 16, verse 16. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Mm. Hallelujah. Have you see that nation being built up? Why? Thousands of students coming out of Israeli universities. The fig tree is budding. Be alert. The coming of the Lord is drawing nigh. For when Zion is built up, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. So there's the first um, sign that the Saviour gives. And then he gives another sign which involves the impending global financial crisis and it is mentioned in that uh, passage there but particularly in Matthew 24 about the abomination of desolation it's to do with world government the abomination of desolation it's a bit of a mouthful isn't it uh, could be translated the abomination of the desolator there's, there's a person in there, a noun, and it refers to the coming financial superman who's going to take control of the global financial system. Now, if you listen to the news, you will know that the world financially is on, I don't know how we're living. We're all living on credit. Britain is living on credit. We haven't got any money. We borrow it all. And the grandchildren will pay it back, you see, there's no problem. They will see to that. And the interest is more than defence and education put together. The whole world is in debt. The greatest debt a nation on earth is America, especially under Joe Biden, who's given away billions and billions, given it away. And we're sending billions to nations that have money to get a rocket to the moon and send people up there with the finance. And friends, the Bible teaches us that the world will be heading in the closing days of time for a sort of financial Armageddon. And many are forecasting this great crisis. All the nations of the world are living on a credit card, borrowed money. You see, that money doesn't even exist. It's on computers. Doesn't even exist. There's no such a thing as that money that we borrow. One day, the Bible tells us that human resources will fail. And that will be the opportunity that a global financial superman will step out onto the world scene. He's called the Antichrist. Have you thought that Antichrist, among many other things, will be a financial superman, a financial genius? Because as we continue to pay our bills and go cashless, that's another thing coming up. They want us to go cashless. Everything's on the card. And for years, I paid on the card. I paid for the petrol coming down here on the card. What's the problem? You pay on the plastic, right? What's the problem? Uh, there is a problem. That financial transaction in the supermarket or at the, 
at the pe petrol pump, that financial transaction, unlike, for, unlike money, can be traced. We're tracing criminals that way. When I make an electronic transaction, any government could find out where I was, who I am, what I paid, and I think, in some cases, my bank details. Here we have a method of surveillance that the dictators of the world would have loved, the, the Hitlers of our world, the apparatus of surveillance that dictators could only have dreamed of. And Antichrist will step out onto the world scene. I see that America is $20 trillion plus in debt at the moment. And here is a warning about the future. Friends, I want you to listen carefully. The world is on course for a one-world banking system, a one-world monetary system. It's being placed, put in place without any word from us, but it's happening in the financial centers. The United Nations, a man called Klaus Schwab and others, they are building a one-world everything. And here the Bible's warnings come in. What's wrong with a one-world government? Be a good idea, wouldn't it? Well, the problem with that is who's going to run this government? Who's going to make the laws coming out of this government? We are warned that Satan's Superman will find his hour. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13, friends. Some of you haven't brought your Bibles. That's okay. Just listen, friends. We just turn quickly to Revelation chapter 13 and we'll see the future of money. The future of money. Revelation 13 and down that chapter, please, at verse 16. And he, who is it? The Antichrist. A man uh, indwelled by satanic energy and insight. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, every global citizen, to receive a mark, interesting, in their right hand or in their foreheads. It will become a numbered society. The world will become a society of people who have to take a mark in order to, to buy and sell. Why is the, the mark on the right hand or in the foreheads? Read verse 17, that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, not a, an, not an, a, a, a demon or an angel, and his number is six hundred, three score and six, the ominous number six, 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 and the coming world, Antichrist, will take control of the world's debt. Here we have the future of money. We're all, all spending. We all spend money. I think, friends, you'll agree with your preacher tonight when I say we all need money to live. Just don't live to have money. That's a big, that's a big snare. We all need money to live, but don't live to have money. Here we see that Antichrist will impose a numbered society. It's already happening. Every little baby, I think, born in Britain today is given a number in the, on the NHS, and it is happening across the world. And Antichrist will bring in this global identity. Every global citizen will be numbered, and it is for the purposes of the control of buying and selling. Go to the supermarket, won't be able to buy unless you, you give your number. Everyone will be a numbered society, a globalized society. Here are some of the buzzwords you'll hear on the television and radio. Here they are, global economy, you'll hear about that. Globalization, the purpose being to submerge national identity into a global identity, and in America particularly, Progressive, 
policies and global reset is all to do with the same uh, mechanism to bring the world into loyalty to the government of the beast. But praise God, before that happens, I shall be away with the Lord. For the next item on God's prophetic agenda is the rapture of the saints. We think that things are going pretty badly, yes. Murder, yes. Killing, yes. And dishonesty in Britain, yes. And uh, theft in the shops are on about that. Unprecedented levels, we think also of the horror of uh, industrialized abortion the murder of millions for what we've, we've killed, representative of whole nations now, billions across the world. I think it's gone over 10 billion. We live in a bad world, but cheer up, we're going to be out of here soon. Believers will be lifted out, not because we deserve to, but because of the cross and because the blood of Christ delivers us from the wrath to come. Uh, 1 Thessalonians, the last verse of chapter 1, we're delivered from the wrath to come. And praise God, we shall be gone in the twinkling of an eye. The rapture, not God's will that his bride, his church, will be put through the wrath of God in the tribulation. How could that be logical? That the Lord would put his precious bride, bought with his blood at the cross, the bride of Christ would go through the seven years of the great tribulation, and then he'll say, you, you can come home and live with me now. Doesn't fit the picture, does it? The bride uh, will not go through the great tribulation. I, I, a lifetime of study, I'm convinced, not all Christians agree, I'm a pre-trib rapture man. And uh, some speak to me after meetings, not often these days, but they do still. Mr. Passmore, uh, you, you, you think we're going to go through the tribulation? Some of them speak to me as if they're looking forward to going through the great tribulation. I don't understand that. Um, but praise God, I believe that we will escape those seven darkest hours of human history, seven years of the great tribulation. It's on its way. And it will be just, it will be God's righteous retribution for the world. And he, he gives, I want to speak to you very, very briefly here, of Revelation 17 and 1 to 4. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come here, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore. What, what is a whore? Well, a prostitute a woman of doubtful morality that sitteth upon the many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit on the scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, they are the colors of prelatism and priestcraft, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand. So she looks pretty good, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. But read what comes next. Upon her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon. Babylon means mystery, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And I saw her and wondered with great admiration. We break off the reading there. Here the Bible warns us of a great false religious system in the last days. A one world government, a one world banking system, a one world church. And we must not be a part of it. We're to come out of it. And if you look at chapter, um, no, no, we'll, we'll leave that verse. The Lord says, come out of her, my people, lest you be a partaker of her plagues. Huh? So there will be some of his people in it. 
but are commanded to come out of it as a warning. Here we have the warning of that Antichrist will have a church, a one world religious system, a one world religion. Does it surprise you, friends, that the world that the future of the world is going to be religious? You see, humans are incurably religious. And if they don't worship Jesus Christ, they'll worship Antichrist. And how sad. And here we have John saw the woman. She's a religious system called Babylon. Confusion. This is the, the aim and the project throughout all my Christian life of the um, ecumenical and world moral faith system. It's to combine all the religions, not just the Christian denominations, all the religions of the world to come into one, the interfaith process. Here we have the beginning of Babylon. Confusion. Put a little bit of Mohammedanism, a little bit of Buddhism, a little bit of Shinto, a little bit of atheism, a little bit of Christianity. Mix it all together. What have you got? Confusion. That's it. That's it. Confusion. A mixture. And we read here that she's decked with the colours of religion. She's dressed up. Oh, very important. Before I finish, she rides the beast. When the Antichrist emerges, she will ride his power. She will be in with him. She commits fornication, that is, illicit intercourse with politics. Here is a church joined to the states across the world, a political church joined to, to political kingdoms. Should the church be joined to any political system? No. The church is already married to Jesus Christ and is the bride of Christ. We cannot be joined with fornication with politics. No. The church is already married to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have the warning of a, a coming global church. She's called a whore, a prostitute. What is a prostitute? A woman who's never taken marriage vows. And here is the church, members of church, that were never married to Jesus Christ. They were part of Christianity, churchianity, chapelitis. But they were never born again. They were never married to Jesus Christ, a religion which includes Christianity, which will be apostate and was never joined to Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.25 reads like this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not the church of Antichrist, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Isn't that wonderful? So the Lord is building his church. Some are speaking of a remnant church. And I know all may not agree. Certainly, probably we do here, but... In the wider church, they don't like me preaching this. You know, friends, it is going to come that the true church will meet in little unrecognized places. Little mission halls like this, praise the Lord. And it belongs to Jesus, every brick. It was bought with dedication of Bible Christians. People that were committed, married to Jesus Christ, you see. Not the harlot church, but the bride of Christ. Um, I had a man say to me the other day, I thought it was good. He said, Alec, do you, do you know that the church will go through the tribulation? I said, is that right? Or you have a different Bible to me. The church will go through the tribulation, yes, but not the bride. <laughs> good? <laughs> he, he, he had me alarmed for a minute. Yes, not the bride, not the true church. See, like Israel has a, and Israel within Israel, the church has a church within the church. Maybe the time will come, we'll meet in homes and in fields, out on the mountains like our fathers before. But Jesus Christ, 
has foreordained that the church will never die. He has foreordained that the church will never die. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But we have to be on our guard. There's another church, a false church, a church which is joined to political structures and we must not have fellowship with them, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, says the Bible, but rather reprove them. Now you've been very kind in your attention. Would you please bow your head with me as we just pray? Father, we bring what we thought about tonight and studied in the Gospel of Luke and other places. And maybe, Lord, we are living just before the Saviour comes. We see the signs around us. We see a world going crazy with sin, a world in rebellion against the righteous rule of Jesus. We pray for your true church, the bride of Christ, that, Lord, we will be faithful to the end. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Help us to stand aside from ecumenism and one-worldism and interfaithism. And may we be faithful to Jesus until he comes. For his glory we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends.